What's up? It's Way Up with Angela Yee. I'm Angela Yee, and we are blessed to have a best-selling author, and I actually met you at University of Michigan. Well, before that, but I did something with yeah. you there. Uh, Marcus Collins, author of For the Culture, the, Beha the Power Behind What We Buy, What We Do, and Who We Want to Be. All right, so Marcus, what exactly um, would you describe your background in? Because uh, when you read this book, we hear about all the different places where you worked, and you're very strategic. <laughs> So I, I, my background has been very diverse. I was an engineer undergrad because I did well in math and science as a kid. And when you're black and you're from Detroit, you go into engineering if you do well in math and science. <laughs> but I decided to go into the music business. Uh, I don't know if that's well counseled. I went to the music <laughs> business, wrote music, uh, didn't do that well. So I went back to school to get my MBA, went out to go work at Apple. And while I was there, I met a guy named Matthew Knowles, mm -hmm. who's Beyonce's father. And he goes, "We're familiar. let me get this straight. <laughs> let me get this straight. You're an engineer. You started a music company. Uh, you have an MBA. You work at Apple and you're black. Fam, you not exist. You're not real. You're a unicorn. I go, no, I'm real. He says, well, you should run digital strategy for Beyonce. I go, yeah, I should totally do that. And? So I ran digital strategy for Beyonce during the I Am Sasha Fierce days and ended up going into the world of advertising uh, thanks to a gentleman named Steve Stout. Ooh, all right. So let's, let's because we're going to talk about Steve Stout in a yeah. minute. He just <laughs> did that interview on Club Shay Shay. You're also an inductee into the American Advertising Federation's Advertising Hall of Achievement, and you're a recipient of the Thinkers 50 Radar Distinguished Achievement Award. Okay, so these are big things, and let's start off with your first foray into the music business, thanks to Matthew Knowles. Mm -hmm. And one thing you talk about in your book, because you detail a lot of the experiences and things that you witness, uh, you talk about the difference between um, the difference between fans and believers, mm -hmm. right? So Beyonce had the Beehive. That's right. But you guys actually tried to start a different group prior to that. So talk about the Beyontourage versus the Beehive. <laughs> yeah, so a part of the job running Digital Strategy was about moving her offline fan club online. Right, and we thought this is like the days of Facebook and Twitter is doing really well, so this is gonna be an easy thing. This is Beyonce moving from the artist to Queen B as we know her, and we launched this thing, and it just <laughs> did not really happen. And we're like, what's going on? Why isn't this taking off <laughs> relative to her celebrity? I mean, she's still huge, right? Um, and the team saw this little small group of people in the recesses of the internet who called themselves the Beehive. They didn't just like Beyonce's songs, they subscribed to the same belief as Beyonce did, women's mm -hmm. empowerment. And we've known that since Beyonce told us, no, 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 can you pay my bills, uh, put a ring on it, uh, uh, you ain't gonna break my soul. Like she's been all about women's empowerment. And these folks, not only do they believe, but they use the music as a way to express their identity. Mm -hmm. They had their own language, they had their own cultural behaviors. We said, those are the folks we should be working with. So we cut bait on the beehive, on the Beyontourage <laughs> and made the Beehive her official fan club. And I think that has been sort of a rocket fuel to catapult her from being just an artist to being an iconic status, not unlike the Taylor Swift of the world. She mm -hmm. has Swifties. Swifties. Right, so these are people who go beyond just being fans, but they are part of a community. They have a shared way of life, a way of seeing the world. And the mm -hmm. artists become sort of a, a signifier of that, a representative of that, much like a plastic doll that we know to be Barbie to mean more than just a plastic doll. Right, they're having their 65th anniversary. I was just posting about Viola Davis. They just did a Barbie of her. I was like, I need to have that. I don't even collect Barbies. <laughs> because it has meaning, yeah. it has meaning. And that's what culture really is about. Culture is a meaning making system. It's a way by which we see the world. And because of the way we see the world, we navigate the world accordingly. We buy what we buy, go where we go, marry who we marry, go, work where we work, uh, vacation where we vacation, eat where we eat, bury the dead if we bury the dead. These things are all byproducts of our cultural subscription. And the more we understand that, the more likely we are to tap into it. That's interesting because you guys had to create a fan base for somebody when one did already organically exist. Mm -hmm. And so the better idea was not to try to push and force this Beyonce on us. <laughs> That's right. And it <laughs> but, that, yeah. like, I mean, to your point, like you don't make communities, you don't build communities, you facilitate them. And sometimes corporations don't understand that. That's right. That's right. You know, too. So I want to talk. Well, let's let's get into some, so then Steve Stout. Yeah. Now, Steve Stout just had an interview on Club Shay Shay with many different viral uh, things happening. You know, he talked about Damon Dash. Damon Dash has already responded mm -hmm. uh, to what he had to say about him. He talked about 50 Cent versus Ja Rule. Mm -hmm. He talked about LeBron and LeBron's uh, original 
originally getting an, an offer for $10 million for a sneaker deal and turning it down when he was 18 years old. Yep. I mean, a lot of different things that he discussed. Do you feel like now culturally people are wanting to tell these stories and feeling, because it used to be, I feel like, that we kind of held those things to ourselves and it, it's like a secret society. Yeah. Things happen in business. Yep. You're not supposed to talk about it. Um, but now it's kind of like, I feel like on, on different podcasts and shows, everybody's telling everything. I mean, there's far more transparency. That's the technology does. It allows us to not only get access to information, but to contribute to the acquisition of information. And you're right, like back in the day, things were very walled off. You didn't know what happened behind closed doors if you weren't behind those doors. And as a result, people didn't get a lot of access. Mm -hmm. But transparency is actually quite empowering. It provides a lot of agency for people to say, oh, that's how they did it. Now I'm going to navigate it this way. I mean, when we hear the stories about Nipsey Hussle, mm -hmm. how he made his way to the industry, that empowers so many people who are like, I have that idea and I've got rhymes and I'm really talented. And it creates a doorway for them to get in. So, yeah, I mean, Stout has been around for a long time. <laughs> and he is, you know, he has lived many lives in many different industries and he has so much knowledge. Uh, institutional knowledge that he shepherded in. I've been the benefit of that working mm -hmm. at Translation for four years and being really close to him. But him providing that information for other people creates, I think, opportunities for people to realize their dreams. I think that's a really powerful thing. And Translation is Steve Stout's marketing agency. That's right. Now, you guys were also responsible for the Brooklyn Nets coming to Brooklyn and the whole campaign that happened there. So talk about those challenges because it was a me being from Brooklyn, mm. y'all definitely targeted people like myself. I was <laughs> definitely right. part of that campaign, <laughs> That's right. um, too, by the way. But also, we have the New York Knicks in New York, which is an institution. That's right. So there were also the battles of the Barclays even existing That's right. in Brooklyn and what people from the neighborhood and community thought about that. So discuss what the thinking was behind bringing the Nets from New Jersey to Brooklyn and then creating a, a fan base or creating a community around that. Yeah. It was a terribly difficult brief because to your point Brooklyn Knights uh, you know New Yorkers in general there tends to be an inherent tension between New Jersey and Brooklyn <laughs> right any export from Brook from New Jersey New Yorkers are like uh, no thank you You're from right? New Jersey yeah. oh you moved to Jersey when you made it exactly exactly <laughs> exactly right so there's inherent tension there so Brooklyn Knights weren't really excited about bringing over the the, the Nets not only that the Nets was not a winning team mm -hmm. so that's not great either. I used to go to the Nets games at the, <laughs> oh, Prudential the Prudential Center, Center yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like they weren't a, a winning team and you're building this new edifice in uh, Atlantic Terminal, which is upseating a lot of local businesses, a lot of local residents. There were protests. There mm -hmm. were documentaries. It'd be like, there's one house this. left standing and this yeah. person will not move. I right. mean, it's, it's, it was pretty bad. Mm -hmm. And the idea was like, well, how do we get people excited about a team that they don't want? So we said, well, let's not focus on the team. Let's focus on the people, the community, the culture of Brooklyn. So we focused on Brooklynites. And what do we know about Brooklynites? They mm -hmm. are the most proud borough ever. You can't tell a Brooklyn night yeah. nothing. Best borough. It, 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 see, there you go. <laughs> exactly, right, right, right. Where, is Brooklyn in a house? That's a real thing. <laughs> so we said, well, let's stoke Brooklyn pride. And what we'll do is we'll borrow from the literature, borrow from what we know of behavioral sciences. A gentleman by the name of, of uh, Edward Bernays, who's a, a nephew of Sigmund Freud, the psychologist, he has this idea in propaganda theory that you can unite a people by declaring an enemy of the state. That you can bring people together by saying that those people are against us. Let's come together. Mm -hmm. We see that in local politics today as well. Right. right? We, we surely this. do. I mean, that's that's that is the entire culture wars. Those people are not us. Bring them together. So that was the thinking. So we'll pull a page out of out of that book. And the idea was that we're going to spark a rivalry that already exists between Manhattanites and Brooklynites. <laughs> so everywhere around Brooklyn, you know, we, we we made these declarations that like, look, if you're not with us, the bridge is that way. Right. Right. Like <laughs> there's so these things that people Brooklynites be like, yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> hello, Brooklyn. Exactly. So hello, Brooklyn became sort of our declaration so that people will go, people who are Brooklynites will use the brand, use the team as a way to communicate their identity, as a way of saying, I'm for Brooklyn, not for Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And that way, the Brooklyn Nets becomes an institution for Brooklynites. And, and I think it was crushed. also the merch, too. That's right. That helped a lot because people were definitely very into the Brooklyn Nets merch. That's right. It was definitely, I feel like, some of the best merch in the league. Yeah. You know what? Well, we Before they played their very first game, this is like months before they played the very first game, we broke Brooklyn Nets' uh, merch that went from number 26 in the league to number four in the league. 
before the team even, even played. Wow. People were like, I want the merch as a way to signal my identity. And the best brands do this. The best brands become uh, receipts of identity, a way by which we can peacock to the world who we are. And as a result, people like us go, I want some of that. And that's the idea of activating communities as opposed to activating fans, activating people who see the world similarly as opposed to activating consumers. Because what's a consumer? Right. People who consume. But people are not you know, machines who eat messages and crap cash. They're real life mm -hmm. human beings. And that's who we need to activate. You know, you brought up politics right before this, and I want to ask you because it feels like when it's time for elections, right, and when it's time for people to get out and vote, and even before that, as we're talking about what's been happening during this presidency, one main theme I always hear is that Joe Biden's presidency doesn't do a great job of marketing things that he has accomplished. Yeah. I would love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah. You know, I would say that the, the Democratic Party in general are just terrible storytellers. Mm -hmm. It's been that way when Barack Obama was in office. We're seeing it right now with, with Joe Biden doing these amazing things that empirically are substantial, yet the general public either don't know about it or they don't believe it. Right. Because there they aren't always great be stories. like, oh, the 84 crime bill. That's but, right. Exactly. And that's the one thing that gets brought up. Because that's a good story. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a great story that the Republican side of the House does a great job of. Good stories, but not a lot of substance. My 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 aunt Anne used to say it this way that people tell the lie like it's a truth mm -hmm. and tell the truth like it's a lie. Right. And Donald Trump would say if you say something enough times, people will think it's true. Exactly. <laughs> One thousand percent. But we but the D Democratic Party sort of waits until these moments in time, like the uh, the State of the Union address t this evening to run down all the facts like, no, fam, you got to be preaching that the entire time. Mm -hmm. So you give people the talking points when they're in their discussions over dinner or with their friends over drinks and they're like, yo, Joe Biden's doing a good job. Someone can be like, no, 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 no. Actually he is. Let me run the facts for you. But the storytelling mechanism of the Democratic Party is flawed. They need to get better at that. And if they did, they'd see a demonstrative difference in not only how people come out and support Biden, but how people use the Democratic Party as a way to communicate their identity. If you were a consultant for them, yeah. what would you say? <laughs> uh, where Where do we start? Yeah, I would start with like, First of all, what do you believe? You know, I think that a lot of the push in 2020 election was we have to stop Trump. And that's what brought people together, right? Declare mm -hmm. enemy of the state. He's our enemy. Come together. Like, I don't like him, but I really don't like him. Exactly. It's like, look, I'll rock with you because I hate this guy. Yeah. And that, that unified people, just like we did with Brooklyn Nets. That's what happens. But now, you know, his base is coming together because... Trump is preaching a gospel that they believe, mm -hmm. right? He's preaching a gospel that people weren't saying beforehand out in the open. Whether or not it's true. That's right. <laughs> and like he's not speaking to them. He's speaking for them, like on their behalf. So what it means for Democratic Party is first start with, I'm Biden. What do I believe? Like, how do I see the world? Now, who sees the world the way I do? Mm -hmm. Now, let me go preach the gospel to them. I mean, this is exactly what Barack Obama did. Right. On on like on his, his whole, exactly. Like <laughs> his on the resume, it wasn't very compelling. Here's this young guy from Chicago, never he held a, a, a you know office in a long you know for a long period of time, and he's black and he wants to be president. Are you kidding me? He's smoking <laughs> crack. That was never gonna happen. Never gonna Polling happen. Polling was terrible at first. No way this is gonna happen. However, he ran on the idea that people believe the government is broken, that 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 politics is broken, not that we have bad legislation, not that we have bad ideas, but people are just skeptical. So he ran on hope mm -hmm. and people are like, I believe that. Yeah, you're right. Like you're saying thing that I feel. And they came together around it. Biden needs to identify how do I see the world? I you your receipts are long, fam. Like you did the thing. You're doing the thing. But now you got to find a way to communicate the gospel that's reflective of who we are, how you see the world, and who people see the world like you. And as the world is always changing, campaigns have to change, too. That's right. And you talk about that a lot in this book as well. Some campaigns that may have gotten stale and needed a refresh. And now I want to talk about a couple of them. Okay. <laughs> um, you talked about the uh, Budweiser, uh, you know, as a brand. Yeah. And how, what's up? That was a, a pretty popular thing that they mm -hmm. had, but then it ran its course. That's right. So then what happens when you have to go in and, and something has run its course? Talk about how you guys have to reset. Yeah. Well, culture is always changing. Mm -hmm. Since culture is always moving, the same way you communicate a thing isn't going to work when things have come out of style, right? You know, I talk about this in the book. You know, we, we did a campaign for Sprite 
Obey you know, your thirst. Yeah, exactly. So we took Obey Your Thirst for the nineties and brought it back, um, you know, saying, you know, only for the thirsty. But the meaning of thirst was no longer like yeah, it was in the like, nineties. Go after what I you don't care about. Be thirsty. Exactly. It's a terrible thing. No one wants to be thirsty. The meaning <laughs> of thirst had changed and therefore the communications didn't work. Mm -hmm. So with 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 Budweiser, after was up kind of lost its favor and you know, they tried a lot of things, didn't work. At translation, we asked ourselves, okay, so what is the cultural zeitgeist right now? Budweiser is sort of the Americana brand. It stood for Americanism. Patriots, I'm proud to be an American, bring home the troops. But patriotism in the, the early 2010s wasn't about flag waving. It was about the dream. I believe in the American dream that if I have an idea, if that I'm talented, if I'm creative, I can make it happen. It's like that's where we're going to celebrate the new Americana, this idea of makers. Mm -hmm. And we thought, who is the most, the most demonstrative representation of that? Jay Z, mm -hmm. right? Here's a guy from Marcy's Project who was unbelievably talented and had enough wherewithal to sort of go after what he believed, and he made it happen. So we partnered with Jay Z, with Budweiser, with Live Nation to create the Made in America Festival that celebrated the makers of tomorrow. See, I didn't realize that's how Made in America came about. Yeah. I, it just felt like a whole separate thing. Like, oh, he's doing a festival now, yeah. but you don't know behind the scenes. All the things that are and and you know what DEI under attack right now, mm -hmm. right? I think that um, the way that translation has been set up with Steve Stout's agency when you were working there, the importance of having diverse voices in the room right. really does matter a lot. That's We've right. seen some campaigns, I mean, totally miss the mark <laughs> and sometimes destroy a brand yeah. because the right people aren't in the room. That's right, and it's not because of ill intent. It's not because these people are bad people. They just don't know. They don't have proximity. They're not close to it. And when we talk about diversity, we all think about diversity as like representation only. And we think we need diverse rooms as a way of being altruistic. Mm -hmm. But like diversity really is a business advantage. Yeah. It's about having multiple perspectives in the room to see things that you don't see. More eyes re removes more blind spots so you can make better decisions and keep yourself out of the crosshairs of boycotts or, mm -hmm. or completely playing yourself. And when they run the numbers, companies that are more diverse actually make more money. 1,000%. And so for people to act like, well, no, we're giving unqualified people positions, that's not true. Yeah. That is giving qualified people the voice that they deserve so that your company, your brand, your products aren't going to fall victim to being tone deaf. That's right. My colleague at the University of Michigan, a gentleman by the name of, of Scott Page, he uh, quantified what he calls the diversity bonus. Like it's an empirical fact that if you have heterogeneous perspectives, multiple perspectives looking at a problem, you're going to get better outcomes, full stop. So I tell a company who's who's being soft on DEI, who's like, uh, the diversity thing mm -hmm. is done. You know, uh, George Floyd, that happened, you know, four years ago. We're, we're done with that. It's like, no, 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 no. This is a way to turbocharge your business, i.e. taking the cultural perspectives from different people to bring it in so you can put rocket fuel against your, your business success. And you know what? Since we were talking about Budweiser, Bud Light, yeah. they... <laughs> had some mishaps. Yeah. And, you know, they had a um, trans woman, Dylan Mulvaney. That's right. Yep. As their representative. And that actually really hurt them. Where did they go wrong? So here's the wild part. So I launched Made in America Music Festival at Translation, and I worked on Bud Light as well mm -hmm. at Translation. And so when the Dylan Mulvaney thing happened, and I saw it happening in, in real time before the, the boycott stuff even started, I go, yeah, of course Bud Light would partner with the transgender person because... For years, Bud Light has been support of the LGBTQ plus community, mm -hmm. right? Even at Translation back in 2012, I was doing marriage equality work for Bud Light because the client said, this community matters to us because they've supported us. We're going to support them. So when I saw the campaign, I go, yeah, of course they would do that. But then the backlash happened. And as a result, they flinched. Mm hmm. Instead of saying, no, we've been doing Stand this forever. Stand 10 toes down. Exactly. And give the backup like, no, this is something that we've always strongly believed right. in. And back Dylan to a, a 10,000th yeah. degree. Instead, it was like, oh, my God, we have to do damage control. That's right. And you hardly ever see a company have such long receipts of being a part of a social cause when it wasn't hot. Mm -hmm. Like when people weren't jumping on, on, on Pride Month, they had already been there. They could have just said, yo, like 
what are you talking about? Or that was Kid, a totally missing the mark. And it's like, yo, Kid Rock, you're shooting up Bud Light cans. We have a picture with you with a drag queen drinking Bud Light. Right. What are we doing here? <laughs> like, I mean, it would have so, like, so many rebuttals or responses to that could have been so easily done. But instead, they said, hey, we don't want no smoke. We don't want no problem with nobody. Mm. We're for everyone. And now the LGBT plus community is like, uh, excuse me. Yeah, we are. Uh, how you playing us? Yeah. Right. I thought you were down with this. So they alienated the people who were boycotting them. They alienated the LGBT plus community. And now all you have are the people in the middle who said, I don't want none of this. I'll mm-hmm. just drink Modelo. Right. And as a result, boom. Yeah. Sales drop. Ooh, all right. That was great. I haven't heard it ever explained in that manner before. That's why I'm here. <laughs> and another campaign that was amazing that you worked in was Travis Scott and McDonald's. Yes. All right. So tell me how that came into fruition and what was behind that. So McDonald's uh, and, and, and Wyden Kennedy, the agency I was, I was most recently at. Hey, uh, Wyden Kennedy. Strategy. Shout out to my girl. Um, that's over there now that used to actually work for the Brooklyn Nets, Sadra. Yeah, JJ. Oh, oh Sadra. Sadra and JJ yeah. both work for the Brooklyn Nets. Okay. They're great people. Love them. Those are my girls. Um, so Wyden Kennedy is working with, with McDonald's. <clears throat> and McDonald's has been battling a lot of hate for a very long time, mm-hmm. right? Like they were the punching bag for everything wrong with the American diet. We're overweight. We're struggling with hypertension because our diets are terrible and it's all McDonald's fault. Villainized, essentially. Uh, so McDonald's says, hey, Wyden Kennedy, help us navigate the hate. And Wyden says, people definitely hate you, but 68 million people show up at your door every single day. That's a lot of love. (laughs) They hate, they love you. (laughs) Why don't you focus on those folks? And they're like, we never thought about it that way. (laughs) So we asked, so who who are these people? Who are these fans who love you so much? They didn't know them very well. So let's get to know them. So we do an ethnography, a road trip, going from Chicago all the way through the heart, heartland of the country, talking to real life human beings who self-identify as McDonald's fans. And what the team found is what we called fan truths. These are like specific, shareable, uh, 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 special little things about being a McDonald's fan. For instance, your friend will ask for fries even though they say they didn't want any fries. Right. That's my wife all day and long. And they got to be hot. Exactly. All day long. Mark's like, I don't want nothing. Can I get a fry? I said, no, you said you didn't want nothing. It. Back up. Right. Or or who doesn't eat the cheese stuck to the wrapper? If you don't, you're a monster because that cheese is amazing. Right. So we found all these fan truths. But the most profound fan truth was this. No matter how big, how famous you are, everyone has an order. And it's like McDonald's is sort of the democratizer Mm -hmm. of humanity in that way, which makes a lot of sense. McDonald's is so ubiquitous, they democratize sort of uh, access to, to food, and they become ways by which we connect. And the team said, oh, that's interesting. What if we stoked fandom by celebrating their orders? So the first thing he did was a te- was a, a Super Bowl ad that show- showcased famous orders from famous people. Like Kim Kardashian eats chicken nuggets with mm-hmm. honey. Um, uh, Magic Johnson eats a filet of fish. Whoopi Goldberg eats a Big Mac. right? And the, the, the fans responded really well to that. Then the team said, well, let's make it real. So they partnered with Travis Scott, who for long has been a huge fan of McDonald's. We've known that from videos, mm-hmm. we've seen him, et cetera. So we took his meal, quarter pounder with shredded lettuce, bacon, barbecue sauce, dipped to fries, and a Sprite, <laughs> and we called it the Cactus Jack. And the merch that came along with it was selling killed. out there. I it remember killed. the Chicken McNugget pillows. That's right, yeah. that's right. So you put it in the world, <laughs> and the the response was crazy. In the first uh, in the first two weeks, we broke McDonald's supply chain of quarter pounder ingredients. Sheesh. People were stealing posters off the wall. Yeah, I remember when that. When the restaurant yep. <laughs> was closed. And we added $50 million to incremental revenue from McDonald's in the first month. And Wall Street added $10 billion to McDonald's market cap. Wow, that's wild. Wild. That, so, so McDonald's yeah. is like, okay, we this is we this got works. a thing here. Yeah, exactly. Let's get Cardi B and Offset in that's here. That's right. <laughs> and J Balvin and Mariah Carey and Sweetie. And like and, and this thing was become this we call it famous orders, but it's really about community orders. These weren't new products. Mm-hmm. They were just reframed through a cultural lens. And people go, Oh, that's my order. <laughs> right, and That's they feel amazing. much, much closer to to each other and to the brand. I also think about how influencers have changed how companies market and promote as well. Oh yeah, because a lot of people with social media are now trying to figure out ways to directly affect and and get into people's brains through trusted influencers. That's right. So, what are your thoughts on that, and how have you used that in any of your yeah, partnerships? So, so, with influencers, they are um, they're far closer to people than like massive celebrities, like the use of the world. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, no, and, I'm, a, I'm more of an influencer. <laughs> but the, so the idea is that you know influencers create content, context, 
and the, the context is, you know, if someone is into cooking and they say, hey, this is the best olive oil, you go, I'm going to trust that because she's really into mm-hmm. cooking. But if someone who's into cooking who's like, hey, these are, you know, the best uh, uh the, the best tires you go what do you know about tires mm-hmm. right like they they provide context yeah. but the truth of the matter is that the most influential people are our people they're the regular people we yeah. talk to like for instance if i saw i don't know if i saw someone jay-z wearing a brooklyn nets hat and i go that hat is kind of dope i have an outfit that matches that and i wear that hat to lunch with my friends and they go you like an idiot take that hat off <laughs> I'm taking that hat off. Right. <laughs> but they're like, yo, Mark, the hat is so dope. I go, I know, right? I'm never taking the hat off. <laughs> right? It's our people who make things stick. Mm-hmm. Celebrities and influencers, they create, they act as contextual media. Okay. They put, they, they put the product in context and act as bright wattage media, but it's our people who decide what actually sticks. And then, you know, and I know you have a flight to catch. Yeah. Lastly, bringing it home for you, okay. Shinola. Yeah. Let's talk about Shinola. And because I always thought that brand was actually originated in Detroit mm-hmm. and was from Detroit. But can you talk about how, sh- and we have a Shinola store in Brooklyn too. Oh, sweet. I didn't know that. Yeah, as well. It's right in the same building. It's in Dumbo, in the same building as Dumbo House. Oh, nice, nice. All right. So talk about Shinola because it's like Shinola Detroit. And- Shinola Detroit is the brand, is the, the mm-hmm. moniker, the uh, the brand. Brand mark as it were, were, but it's owned by a company called Bedrock, which actually is uh, is headquartered in Dallas, Texas. And the way the the story goes, the lore that we know it is that Bedrock said we want to start a, a watch company. They already had watches; they own Fossil watches. Mm-hmm. So they go, we want to do an upscale watch company, but we need to find a place, a good story for it to to, to live. So they did a survey. They asked people if we started a a, a watch store in these, a watch company in these cities. Which one would be more, which be more compelling? And people said, "Ooh, Detroit," because this is at a time Detroit was battling bankruptcy. So the idea was that buying from Detroit felt like you were contributing to the city. <laughs> so people bought into that. They're like, "I right? want to do something that means something," because you right. care about the story behind the brand. That's right. That's right. So it wasn't from Detroit, but they implanted it there, and then they used the name Shinola which actually comes from a, uh, a shoe polish company okay. that was defunct. And if you looked at that, those campaigns, all the the, the caricatures were menstrual. They were oh, wow. blackface. They were shiny oh, shoes. They were like okay. monkeys. Right? So I didn't they, even know that. Yeah, so when you see that, the juxtaposition that seems very, very complex, that you go to arguably the blackest city in the country, Detroit, and you borrow equity from a company named that, that depict black people in this very Mm -hmm. horrendous way. What's going on here? Um, And though I think the product, the Shinola products are great, the leadership there is awesome now. But at the time, it was very problematic. I thought it was worth mentioning in the book because stories, as we talked about with the Democratic Party, is are they're so powerful. They are the currency Mm -hmm. of community. So telling stories bring us together, but also socialize what's normal for people like us. But we can use stories to help project things forward but stories can also be used in a very damning way that that can undermine sort of civil good. And I think that Shinola's init- initial uh, move forward was problematic, but the leadership that are in place now are making some really Kind of like Planned tries. Parenthood. Yeah. <laughs> you right. know, because when yeah. you hear about Planned Parenthood, they always talk about the origins That's right. of Planned Parenthood, but the good that it does now. Exactly. Exactly. Can't, yeah. That's right. But those stories have to be told. Mm-hmm. Like, you have to air out Own the it. bad stuff. People will talk about the Democratic Party and how it started. That's right. And where we are now is completely different than That's where right. it started. That's right. You have to you have to air the bad laundry so people stories. can can appreciate you hear that where you Florida are. Florida school system. That's right. Okay, slavery did exist. It was involuntary and it was <laughs> yeah, not helpful right. for us. <laughs> exactly, 1000%. All right, well Dr. Marcus Collins and by the way, he is a professor at the Ross School of Business at University of Michigan. Those students, I know, are so grateful to have you. <laughs> Honestly, you so as a much. professor, because those classes are fun, I had an opportunity to sit with you also. You crushed it, by the while way. While I was there, I had a great time. Yeah. And the book, For the Culture, The Power Behind What We Buy, What We Do, and Who We Want to Be. Y'all will love it because you get to see the inside stories be- behind some of the campaigns. And some of I found it to be quite insightful and entertaining. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so grateful. So thank you so much for coming through. Go catch a flight. And thank you for my merch. For thank the you, culture, y'all. It's way up.